Welcome to the Calumet Roundtable. I'm your host, Tom Roach. I'm joined today by my guest, Stuart Deschel. Stuart, welcome to the Calumet Roundtable. Thank you, Tom, for inviting me. Very good. Uh, Stuart uh, was born in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Uh, he's an American poet and professor in English. He, he uh, teaches creative writing in the Master of Fine Arts program at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. Uh, Stuart is the winner of the National Poetry Series Award, the Pushcart Prize, two National Endowment of the Arts Fellowships, uh, the North Carolina Arts Fellowship, the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Fellowship. In his book, Good Hope Road, was just uh, republished by the Contemporary Classics series of Carnegie Mellon Press. Um, Stuart, let's, um, let's start by talking about um, poetry in general here. What's, you know, what's the interest level in poetry uh, in 2016? I think it's actually very high. I think that has a lot to do with the new technologies and the availability of poetry to everyone. Um, I think that uh, when I was coming up as a poet, you would have to find your poetry in the bookstores or the library, but yeah. I think the internet has made poetry much more available and accessible to all people. Interesting. So uh, it's not getting squeezed out by uh, rock and roll records and uh, you know, movies and... Well, you know, it's a dedicated audience who reads it, and yeah. most of the people who read poetry in our country also happen to write it by some great coincidence. Yeah. But since there are many poets now in our country, and since uh, poetry has become, I think, the most democratic of art forms in our country, meaning that anybody can write it, we need no special equipment yeah. to do it, um, it's become decentralized, essentially, 30, 40 years ago, most poetry came from publishers in Boston or New York or San Francisco, yeah. but today poetry is published by presses all over the country and represents so many different points of view and diversity. Very good. And um, what does it uh, take to get published today? What, you know, I, I just as a, as a little preface to this. <clears throat> um, it seemed when I was in college many years ago um, that there were certain dominant themes and, uh, and, and stylistic uh, preferences. And um, you kind of knew what those were if you were studying poetry. And you, you played with that. You fit or didn't fit it. But you kind of knew where you were in relationship to that. Today, I, you know, I pick up maybe National Review of Books or I look at a, you know, a poetry book or something, and I don't. I don't have a sense anymore that there's a, there's a continuity to it. It just seems like we've gone off in a lot of different directions. But you, you have, I'm sure, a better sense of this than I do. What, what's the case? Well, I think that's true. And again, I think it has to do with a decentralization. And you know, some years ago, perhaps there were 50 books of poetry came out in a given year. Now several hundred come out in a given year. I think yeah. it's very hard for people to keep up with the full um, amount of work that's being published. But I think it represents, again, many different kinds of styles. Yeah. Um, you know, presses we find, you know, come from all over, really all over the country, as I've, as I've said before. Um, Unicorn Press, for instance, um, yeah. is doing this book of mine in the fall, and they're doing this book as an artisan book. And I think that that's going to be a major trend in poetry, that most people will read poetry um, on their screens and will buy books of poetry uh, more seldomly, unfortunately. But many yeah. of the books that will be published will be more artisanal books, yeah. uh, rather than uh, collections that are published, say, today by the major trade presses. Yeah, so, uh, let me see that. Uh, so, so someone buys this book for the poetry, but also because of the printing process and the quality of the paper and, uh, and all of that. That's, that's, uh, it's an interesting way to uh, look at it. Well, so what about something like Poetry Magazine? You know, do they, are they still looking for certain kinds of poetry or? I'm not certain because in my uh, yeah. nearly 40 years of sending my work out for publication, they have never taken a single one of my poems. Yeah. So I don't read them very frequently. Uh, the last poet we interviewed, uh, Michael Daverstein, actually yeah. had some poetry published in Poetry Magazine, and I was just so in awe of that yeah. because, of course, they discovered T.S. Eliot. And, yeah. Uh, you know, figured very prominently uh, in the history of, uh, of the art. Um, well, well, let me ask it this way then. Um, we, we look back at the, say, the um, early 20th century and we say, well, the Imagist 
poetry movement was beginning at this time, right? Um, do you think people look back at, at our period and say, this is what was going on there, this is what was dominant? I know we've been, you've been saying that yeah. there's a lot of things going on, but is there a, are there some common themes or elements here? I think uh, many of the newer books being published by younger books, by younger poets rather, yeah. are uh, books that often tell my American story, mm -hmm. and uh, they're written by young people whose um, families have come from very diverse places and yeah. are um, off sometimes new Americans. And um, it's very important for them to tell their stories. And I think the stories and the people who are telling them are quite different uh, than, say, the people who are writing the imagist poems of the earlier 20th century. Right. I think one of the big trends has been uh, if you look at books published in the 50s and early 60s, almost all of the poets attended Ivy League universities. Right. Uh, since the advent and explosion of Master of Fine Arts programs, most of which occur at state universities, it has brought more people to the table and made education both more affordable and available. Yeah. And so I think that has changed it as well as to who gets to tell their story in our culture. And you've had uh, several students from Greensboro uh, get published. That is true. Um, can you give us some examples? Yes, uh, Ansel Elkins, who's now teaching on our faculty, uh, graduated our program eight years ago. And uh, last year, she was, her first book of poems was published by the Yale Younger Poets Prize, a major triumph. Uh, tomorrow, uh, our, uh, I will be heading back to Greensboro to introduce a poet named Jennifer Whitaker, who also just won a major award for her work. Uh, another poet, Maria Hummel, had a book out the year before last, a beautiful book called House and Fire, published uh, by Copper Canyon Press, and it won a major award from American Poetry Review. And I think that's been a very satisfying part of my life over these last number yeah. of years, to see my former students yeah. doing so well with their work. Yeah, I, I really envy you. My, yeah. my students who are doing well are uh, making money for big corporations. <laughs> I, I really don't relate to that so well, but... Uh, maybe you get them to I, give it to poetry. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe we could work something out there. Or endow us professorships. Yeah. Well, so uh, does anyone make a living uh, as a poet today? Um, I think a few people do. Uh, I think Allen Ginsberg had made a living yes, uh, while he, did, he was yeah. alive. His books sold very well. I wouldn't be surprised if a poet like Billy Collins, uh, whose work is widely published uh, and well received, um, makes uh, a living as well. But the living is made not from the publishing of poems, but from the giving of readings at universities and um, other kinds of venues. Uh, it's kind of uh, funny, I'll tell you a little anecdote that uh, I had a poem that recently was published in a magazine that comes out of Atlanta called Five Points. And uh, in that poem, there's a phrase in it, uh, the house that poetry paid for. And some fellow wrote me an email recently saying, well, I'm quite envious of you to have a house that poetry paid for. And you know, I said, I wrote him back saying, well, it really didn't, you know. It's just kind of a, a phrase here. And I said, we ought to think of the repercussions of a word like paid in all of its, um, in all of its potentials rather than the literal. But uh, then he wrote an imitation of my poem because poetry never paid for anything in his life. Right, right. Um, you're, uh, you have a poem that's been uh, uh, parodied and, uh, and used uh, for inspiration for other poems called Days of Me. Um, what was it like seeing your, your work being reflected by other people as you were coming up as a poet? Well, you know, I, I saw some of this happen actually with my first book, Good Hope Road. There's a yeah. series of poems, and they're called Apartments. And I found whenever I was doing events at schools, oftentimes their creative writing teachers had them write imitations or variations yeah. of those poems. It's kind of shocking in a way, to be quite yeah. honest. It yeah. sort of made me almost feel like my process might be too easy <laughs> uh, in, in that way. But perhaps parody is a form of a compliment. With Days of Me, uh, I think some people People have just kind of tried to fill in the blanks for their details. But yeah. I, again, I fear that people sometimes don't understand the humor or irony in this, and they think what I'm writing is actually factual. Right. Um, when, you know, it's my poetry is often a mixture of autobiography and fiction, and the art part is that you don't know which part is which. Right, and the art right? drives it. Yeah. yeah. 
So um, who are some poets who you, you feel have um, you know, spoken through you a little bit when you're writing your own work? Well, uh, you know, I, I feel like if I start mentioning some of the names, I feel like I'd be puffing myself up. Well, but, but you know. Pablo Neruda is a constant influence yeah. Uh, yeah. in my in, in my work. Uh, the French poet uh, Guillaume Apollinaire, another French poet Robert Desnos, uh, American poets such as Elizabeth Bishop, in particular Marianne Moore, uh, Robert Lowell, uh, are all poets whose work affects me deeply. Uh, uh, some poets who are friends of mine, their work continues to inspire me. Uh, poets like the late C.K. Williams, for instance, uh, other poets uh, writing today, Stephen Dobbins, Thomas Lux, Murray Howe, Ellen Hinsey, uh, among them, Jeffrey Green, their work continues to inspire me as well. Um, I did mention many poets writing other languages at the beginning, and did, I do find yeah. inspiration in the work of people uh, whose uh, work comes from other times and other languages and cultures. You don't learn a lot about the process of writing or the music of poetry from these people, but you do learn quite a bit about the imagination. Yeah, so there's almost a, a, a context that comes with each language, right? And it, uh opens different doors maybe. Yeah, it does yeah. it do, it does for me certainly. Yeah. Are you, now the French poets, you're reading them in French or uh, sometimes I'm reading them in French, sometimes yeah. I'm plodding along in English, sometimes yeah. I've dared try to translate them. I've been working on translations of uh, a posthumous book uh, by Robert Desnos. Uh, and um, I'm not sure I have all the translations right or not. I'd be very um, cautious, perhaps, to show it to my French friends uh, to see how poor my translations are. Yeah. But I think after reading his work for so many years, I feel very close to it. And perhaps, if I might say so, I feel like I have some insight into the work that's just come yeah. with living with it over the years. So there, yeah, there, there's an honesty to your insight, you know, even if the uh, literal uh, translation is or, or maybe too literal is translation the, is the problem. Yeah, yeah no, I, I understand. OK, we're going to take a quick break. The Calumet Roundtable will be right back. Welcome back to the Calumet Roundtable. I'm your host, Tom Roach. My guest today is Stuart Deschel, and we're continuing our discussion on poetry. Um, Stuart, I, I'm just curious that I've got you on camera here, and I can you know, uh, uh, ask any question I want of a, of a real poet. Uh-oh. Um, I, um, you know, I have some poems that were really important to me at some point in my life. You know, I, when I was in fourth or fifth grade, I had to memorize a poem, and I, I found this poem called El Dorado by uh, Edgar Allan Poe, and I, and I memorized it. And that poem just has stayed with me my whole life. Um, we were talking earlier, and you mentioned uh, a poet. You said, well, he's not a great poet, but you knew a lot about him. Um, who, who are some people, who are some, what are some poems that really stuck with you that, that still echo for you? Well, I think uh, one of the first poems that meant something to me was the poem Elegy for William Butler Yeats by the poet W.H. Auden. Oh, really? uh, and I, I think perhaps it was partly because I was a young man with great literary pretensions and yeah. uh, the fact that there was a poem about Yeats, a poet whose work I knew and respected yeah. as a high school student, and this all happened about 16 to 18 uh, when many people become poets. And, um, and this poem, because it was a beautifully written elegy, partly in Yeats's own style, appealed to me greatly. I knew it was important, though I didn't understand it. The language sounded important to me. Yeah. And uh, it seemed very unlikely. I actually remember talking about the poem with a friend of mine, uh, who's a novelist whose family is from Ukraine, a man named Oskold Melnichuk, and sitting in the dormitory room in college when we were freshmen talking about that and those po that poem and about wanting to be writers. And I guess if we only knew how unlikely it would be for us to be actually become writers, uh, maybe we wouldn't have even persisted. Right, right. Um, and you, uh, you had an experience uh, with writing something that uh, 
reminded someone of Robert Altman's Nashville. Um, can you uh, talk, us, talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, I've been um, at work on a novel over this last year, and perhaps a misguided uh, attempt of someone who spent their life writing poetry. Uh, we don't have that many writers today who write both poetry and right. fiction, uh, which uh, I think is, is a shame. I wanted to write fiction when I was younger, but I think my attention deficit disorders and perhaps general slackerliness uh, made it very difficult for me to spend the amount of hours that are really required for you to write for you to write fiction. The poet can write poetry walking around or lying in bed in the poet's pose. Uh, uh, and is, is that the key to it? You're, yes, yeah. you have to put your, the back of your hand on your forehead and look yeah. like you're fainting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll try that next time. I write poetry in my <coughs> in my head often before yeah. I'll put it down on paper, sure. but a novel is something else. In any case, as I was talking through what I was doing with yeah. this novel to a friend of mine, uh, Jens Martin Eriksson, who's a Danish novelist, he said, boy, that sounds like a Robert Altman film, perhaps. It really sounds like what you've done is created a Nashville set in Paris. And, and you hadn't thought of the Altman connection yet? No, not at all. Yeah. But I do, I am a great admirer of his films, sure. and, uh, and Nashville in particular. And I guess hearing that gave me some more guidance and structure to what I was doing. Um, Altman, of course, is not everyone's favorite director. Some yeah. people, you know, find his work uh, a little more yeah. annoying, and the fact that he has so many characters in his right. uh, films as well. Right. Yeah, Altman, uh, I think, started out directing uh, Gunsmoke on TV. I think that was one of his early credits. Is that right? I didn't yeah. know that. <laughs> and um, and as he, you know, as his career advanced, he's, it seemed like he got less and less structured. Uh, I, I think his first hit was uh, was the Mash movie. Yeah, yeah. And it was one of the first movies where people were talking over one another, and you couldn't you couldn't collect all the dialogue. And uh, but uh, Nashville kind of was sort of at the extreme end of yeah. it because it was almost like he just intersected some conversations. Um, but um, but I think that's a great mm. comparison, you know, because I think that it. Uh, uh, it implies then that you are, um, uh, if, you know, like like a poet should do. You're feeling your way into something and not mm -hmm. trying to impose some structure on something that. Well, well, I also like yeah. putting characters in my poems. In this book, Good Hope Road, my first book, yeah. which we were talking about in the first half of the show, yeah. which has just been reprinted, the whole first section are character portraits of people, yeah. and. Uh, uh, the way in which uh, they don't interact so much, but the way in which they make their claims for themselves. Yeah. Well, so then, did you go with that Altman analogy, and did that help you? Uh, it helped me with, it a little bit with the novel I'm working on. I'm yeah. still not finished it, and yeah. uh, I don't know when I will. Once you get started on something like this, it's hard to really know when right. it's when it's done. I also find writing prose, fiction or nonfiction, much more difficult than writing poetry. Uh, the uh, French poet uh, Paul Valéry famously said, uh, a poem is never finished, only abandoned. But that seems to me actually to be more of the structure for fiction or nonfiction for me, because poetry has certain protocols, yeah. lineations, rhythms, um, other ways in which poems are put together, stanzas, uh, uh, formal structures, or it seems to me that a paragraph of prose uh, can be written and rewritten over and over again. Yeah, I, I, I get that too. I think, you know, if you're working on a poem, at some point you, you realize this fits and no. you're more likely to feel like you're done with it. Actually, that, that description again, uh, it's not, it's never done, it's abandoned. I think no. that was a good description of my dissertation. Yeah. Um, actually, I think my, uh, my advisor told me that. But anyway, um, the, um, uh, this idea of poems being done, do you, you know, what does that mean to you when it's done? What do you, I don't know. You know, poetry that? is the art of the possible that's seeking a condition of inevitability. And, <laughs> um, you know, you're trying to write words that seem like, you know, they can't easily be replaced. When you read, say, a poet yeah. like Elizabeth Bishop and you go through yeah. the dozens of drafts of her poems, uh, you see how she um, strived and struggled towards the creation of, of lines that, uh, you know, would last. And if you try to tamper or play around with those lines, you, you can't find ways yeah. in which which you would ever wish to change them. Yeah, I have uh, uh, poems that I that I drafted years ago, and there's something in there that I really like and I want, and I keep going back to it, trying to make it work, and I can't do it. And I wonder if maybe 
you know, maybe some things just aren't there, and it really is a matter of, you know, like doing a crossword puzzle. There's, o there's only one word that's going to fit, and if you don't find it, you, or if it's not there, it doesn't go any further. Right. Uh, a friend of mine calls it having itis about a poem. And itis. She, itis. Yeah. She said after I first pop, my first book came out, she said to me, Stuart, are there some poems that still give you itis? <laughs> and I, st I didn't know what she was talking about. And I started thinking, yeah, I do. You know, there's a word here, or a phrase there that I know I've gotten as close to it as I could, but maybe I could have done a little bit better. Yeah. Um, can you give us an example? Can you think of anything offhand? Oh, no, I think I fixed them all by now. You fixed no, them all, no. yeah, okay, all right. You're on TV, so they're all fixed. Yeah, they're, yeah. All, they're all perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, you have, do you have one that you've, um, you've gone back to several times and haven't, have never been satisfied with it? Well, I haven't published any of them mercifully. Well, but of course, I, you yeah. know, um, but I well, or I have published them actually in magazines, and it's not like I'm testing them out on magazines. But sometimes, but it, there's but no focus group for poets. Well, you know, <laughs> sometimes the focus group is actually giving a reading, like the one I'm going to do this evening, in which yeah. when I, you know, it's a very different circumstance to read my poetry to my dog as I'm composing it, yeah. uh, who seems to like everything I do. Yeah. You know, dogs like, are like that. Yeah. I know my cat was a much better critic. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, and it's very different to actually read your poems to people and, and get some kind of reaction or at least hear the words come back to yourself in front of an, in front of an audience. I yeah. mean, poetry is essentially an oral art form. And if you aren't able to say it to people and you're only um, basically reading your poems over in your mind, at least that wouldn't take me very far as a writer. Yeah. When I'm writing, I say my the words aloud to myself so I can hear their music um, as I'm composing them. So how important is the sound of the words to you? Incredibly important. That to me is the most important thing. Really? Yeah. Actually, I'm never really sure what my poems are about until I'm somewhere in the process of writing them. I've never really sat down and said, oh, I'm going to write a poem today about having a broken heart, or I'm going to write a poem today about my father's death, or I'm going to write a poem Those today. Those country songs. Yeah. Well, they are, too. <laughs> I'm going to write a poem about, you know, a blind girl in Paris, or, you yeah, know. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, you know, but ultimately, I have written all of those poems. Yeah. But usually, a poem begins with, um, a phrase, uh, a word uh, that, I, that I want to use, and somehow a line comes out of it, and then another line, and then somewhere uh, early on, I begin to sense the direction of the poem and feel so, like I've found it. So you it. start with a phrase or a line, and then you're following it rather than right. constructing right. it, right? And, and as you're following it, you're following the sound more than the I'm following the sound and the imagery yeah. in the poem. But, Does it uh, sort of combine for you? I'm just curious. Is it? Uh, I think there is a way in which it, which yeah. it combines itself. Um, although it's you know hard oftentimes to say that an image can take the form of a sound, but obviously the words you know you, you hear the words in your mind or yeah. as you articulate them and uh, and uh, you know and they s adhere to each other. Yeah. I've often thought that maybe you know the the poems that I'm uh, most partial to are the ones that sound the best, and that I you know that I'm looking at them more closely and right. getting more meaning out of them maybe because of that um, you know uh, uh, poem that everybody knows, "Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock." Oh. Um, the the sound of that poem is just hypnotic to me for yeah. some reason. The 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 rhythms right. that, that break and start right. again and. Well, it is yeah. very hypnotic. It begins with a patient etherized on a table, a table, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, immediately we get this kind yeah. of hallucinatory uh, sense sensibility. Yeah. And yeah. but you know, it's and also, then it, it ends. He says, "Till human voices wake us and we drown." There we go. Yeah. There we go again. Yeah. But uh, it, it, it's also incredibly important to me that my poems are accessible which doesn't mean that everything about them has to be understood, but that I wish my poems to be understood just as I yeah. wish myself, perhaps, to be understood. Yeah. Uh, um, William Carlos Williams, a great poet from the modernist period, yeah. has these lines uh, towards the end of his poem in which he says, he's talking to his, um, I'm not sure whether it's his mother or grandmother in the poem, but he says, yeah. all this was for you, old woman. I wanted to write a poem that you could understand. And then he says, but you got to try hard. <laughs> right? 
Well, he wrote some very understandable poems very understandable. Uh, about red wheelbarrows and uh, things like that, right? Right, and also about a young housewife tucking in uh, her, you know, her corset and, uh, and making the observations he did as a doctor on his rounds. Yeah, that's right. I forgot. To be Maybe doctor. doctors need to go on rounds again. <laughs> Yeah, not just in the hospital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they need to get on a on a uh, in a buggy with a horse right, and, uh, right. and, and stop in places at, after dark. Yeah. Um, so, um, getting back to the the sound and the meaning mm. a little bit, um, you know, if you're maybe maybe there's something you could read to us here. We've got a couple minutes at the end. Uh, would would that be okay? You want to? Yeah, that would be fine. Pick something that you think really has a sound to it, a quality to it that you like a lot. Well, that's a, that's a hard question right away, but let me take a look yeah. here. Um, yeah. Well, I could talk about this poem, Days of Me, a little bit. Please do, yeah. yeah. This, is, this is your most uh, uh, published poem, I think, right? Yeah, it's been in quite a number of yeah. anthologies. And uh, it actually, I think I told you this, that it began as a joke between myself and a poet friend of mine, David Rivard. And I had moved down to teach in North Carolina after living for 14 years in Boston. And I loved yeah. living in Boston. And David would often say to me, we miss you. And one day I said, well, I miss me too. And then I said, and he started to laugh. And I said, well, maybe I've got something here. And yeah. it was kind of a race as to who was going to write it. Uh, so let me just read the beginning of this poem. OK, good. Yeah, we've got, we got about 30 seconds left. All right. So, so, yeah. Days of me. When people say they miss me, I think how much I miss me too. Me, the old me, the great me. Lover of three women in one day. Modest me, the best me. Friend to waiters and bartenders. Hearty laugher and name rememberer. Proud me, handsome and her suit. In soccer shoes and shorts. On the ball fields behind MIT. Very, very nice. I, I really could hear the, uh, the connection uh, in the vowels and the consonants there. And, uh, right, and I, it's also, it's also uh, yeah. plain spoken language. Yeah, yeah. right, and, and, and understandable. Yeah, um, and energized, I hope. Yeah, yeah, and, so, and, and, that, and I can see how that drove the poem. That's really interesting. I, I, I sounded, it was a very different experience for me hearing it. Thank you. Thank you. OK, that's all the time we have for our program. Um, and I really appreciate uh, Stuart Deschel for uh, joining us today. Um, and the Climate Roundtable um, is finished. And I'm your host, Tom Roach. Have a great day.